On the border of the Commonwealth's glowing sea, there sits a tiny, ruined town that is crumbling into the waters of a man-made lake. Its commercial district, once a raider outpost, has been overrun by supermutants. A supermutant behemoth stalks the local power substation, and at the edge of town, Deathclaws prowl. I'm the irresolute cartographer, and this is the story of that small town. This is the story of Natick, Massachusetts. We'll start this with an examination of the sites surrounding Natick in the Fallout universe and in the real world. We'll then move into the layout of the town in the Fallout universe and how it compares to the town in the real world. We'll examine the history of Natick in the Fallout universe and a brief history of Natick in the real world. We'll then close with some notes that I have on the topic. With that said, let's get started. In the Fallout universe, Natick lies west-southwest of Boston, near the western edge of the section of the Commonwealth that we get to explore in Fallout 4. On the northern edge of town lies a water pumping station known as Poseidon Reservoir. To the northwest lies the tomb known as the Boston Mayoral Shelter. Further north of that lies Fort Hagen, one of the primary military bases in the region. To the northeast of Natick, the gunner mercenaries have built an elevated camp atop the Mass Pike Interchange. The town sits on the western shore of man-made Lake Kachichuit. Across the lake to the east lies the dangerously contaminated Mass Fusion Disposal Site. South of Natick lies the glowing sea and all the radioactive ruins within. Let's now compare the locations of real-world sites that can be found in the game with their locations in-game. Just as in the game, the real-world Natick lies south-southwest of Boston, approximately 15 miles distant. While the town lies primarily on the western shore of Lake Kachichuit in-game, the real town straddles a lake, although its heart and historic core sit on its southeastern shore. Northern Central Natick is home to the United States Army Soldier System Center, which may be an analog for Fort Hagen, but other than being military sites north of the heart of Natick, I don't know of any other connections. Real Natick is connected to Boston by both I-90 and the MBTA's Wooster Line. While in-game there's a major highway running north of Natick, there's nothing resembling a passenger rail line running through the town. In the game, the town's quite small. It's laid out primarily along an unnamed north-to-south road that runs parallel to Lake Kachichuit. Speaking of the lake, it's started eating away at its western shoreline, and some of the buildings have begun to fall into it. While the heart of the town is a commercial district, there are houses on the hill to the west and on the eastern shore of Lake Kachichuit. Along with this, there's a motel at the northern end of town and a large power substation up the hill to the west. I see no real connections between the in-game and real-world layouts. Alright, comparisons aside, let's get into the composition of Natick in the Fallout universe as it's represented in Fallout 4. Natick is home to seven houses, the Roadside Pines Motel. There are many small businesses which appear to have apartments above them. Among these businesses are two diners, a bar, an antiques shop, a bookstore, a salon, a locksmith, a law office, a Pulaski Preservation Shelter, and a Red Rocket Station. There are a couple of warehouses on the western and northern sides of town, and a large power substation on the western hill. In terms of community buildings, there is a police station, and a church with an attached graveyard. With the setting established, let's get into the story of Natick and the Fallout universe. Before the bombs, Natick was a small town, where the locals made a living working at the Poseidon Reservoir pumping station, the warehouses, or one of the many service businesses in town. Those with means recreated on Lake Kachichuit. As for the lake, if it's anything like the real Lake Kachichuit, it once served as a reservoir for Boston, before it was replaced in that role by those with larger capacities, leaving it in the hands of the locals. While this small community may have been thousands of miles from the battles with the Communist Chinese, the symptoms of the war hung over them. South of town, a military checkpoint monitored all those coming and going from the Boston area. The Pulaski Preservation Shelter took advantage of the anxiety the thought of nuclear war elicited. And for the Wu family, the war had devastating consequences. Initiated with the Chinese invasion of Alaska in 2066, the war with the People's Republic of China had created an anti-Chinese sentiment in many of the American people. The 2070s were a challenging time for Americans of Chinese ancestry, and the Wu's sadly experienced this firsthand. As of the fall of 2077, most of the Wu family was living in the heart of Boston, a short distance from the Boston Common and the Pearwood Apartments. Little Kim Wu was a witness to anti-Chinese riots in which mobs tore down an arch, while the police simply watched on. With violence in the area rising, the American government started rounding up Chinese Americans to take them off to camps. Though Kim's mother managed to hide most of the family on the rooftop, unfortunately, Kim's aunt Song was caught up in this and hauled off. In the aftermath of this, the family fled Boston and made their way to Kim's uncle Marshall's house in Natick. Here, they tried to maintain a low profile, but were still met with prejudice from the locals. When Kim made friends with a local boy named Jason, 
He brought a copy of Red Menace to the Wu house and told Kim that they should learn something from it. Kim's father saw Kim playing with it and sent Jason home with the game immediately and banned him from the house. When Kim's uncle Marshall had friends over to watch the World Series, the Wu's kept quiet and out of sight. This sad state of affairs continued until the fourth weekend of October 2077. That Saturday, October 23rd, Kim was awakened by sirens, followed by a huge boom. To their southwest, a massive nuclear bomb exploded. Just one of the many bombs that detonated across the world that day. The force of that explosion blew the neighboring forest down and even launched a tree onto the roof of the Natick Church. Cars and clocks stopped as the electromagnetic pulse fried their circuits. At the Poseidon Reservoir pumping station, where it was take your child to work day, the EMP shut down all the pumps. Shaking caused by the bomb covered a road on the hill west of town with a landslide. Some people in town were killed almost immediately, possibly brought down by flying broken glass and debris. At the house on the hill, the occupants took the easy way out rather than face a life after the bombs. At Marshall's house, the persecution of the Wu family meant they were fortuitously in the basement when the wave of radiation and force radiated out from the crater. Kim's father and Uncle Marshall departed wearing all the protective gear they could muster and attempted to purchase whatever water and food they could. That night, as the Wu's slept in the basement, a group of survivors took refuge in the house. As they couldn't tell how much of a threat these intruders were, the Wu's decided to flee the house as soon as they were sure the intruders were asleep. That's the last we know of the Wu family and Natick in the days immediately following the Great War. Much of the story of Natick in the two centuries after the bombs has been lost, but by the 2280s, the town was under the control of a raider gang. They had fortified the town square with walls of scrap, but it wasn't enough to prevent a party of super mutants from taking it from them. Though the raiders were pushed out of the town square, they maintained control over the nearby Roadside Pines Motel. Across the lake, another group of wastelanders established an outpost that was recently overrun by Mirelurks. In 2287, the sole survivor of Vault 111 visited the community at least once, when they were hunting for a holotape related to the crime boss Eddie Winter that was in the hands of the Natick Police Department at the time of the bombs. While much of the police station had fallen apart as the land beneath it crumbled into Lake Kachichuit, the holotape was luckily still safe and dry in the station. They potentially also could have visited the Poseidon Reservoir pumping station for a Poseidon radar transmitter that the USS Constitution needed to take flight, assuming that they couldn't jerry-rig a replacement. Aside from that, the town would also serve as an occasional target for scavenging and extermination missions from the various factions controlling the Commonwealth at that time. The Brotherhood of Steel were also known to patrol Natick following their arrival in the Commonwealth. That's about all I could find on Natick in the game, so let's look at the history of Natick in the real world. I've covered the geological and paleo-Indian history of Massachusetts before in other videos, so we'll start this at the time of the arrival of the English. When the Pilgrims landed in 1620, the area at which Natick stands today was under the control of the Nipmuc. I've covered the Nipmuc tribe before, so I'll move on to 1632 when John Eliot arrived in Massachusetts with missionaries to bring Christianity to the natives. In 1651, he negotiated with the native leaders Waban and Kualalanset to establish Natick as a town for, quote, praying Indians, unquote. With the town established, some of the Nipmuc moved in to learn English and convert to Christianity. Here, they established a lookout farm which still exists today. John Eliot was devoted to his mission, and in 1663 he published the Algonquin Bible. Having learned the Algonquin language of the tribes he wanted to reach, he had translated the Bible into their language, and in the process, created the first Bible published in English America. Relations between the natives and the colonists devolved over the years, and in 1675, Medicum, also known as King Philip, launched a war against the English. Over the next three years, King Philip's War, potentially the bloodiest war per capita waged in American-slash-colonial American history, would rage across New England. The English colonists relocated the praying Indians to Deer Island and Massachusetts Bay during the war. While on Deer Island, many died to exposure and malnutrition. I spoke about this in my video on Quincy as well. While they were eventually returned to their towns, these towns were never the same. Over the decades, the plots of the towns were sold out to colonists, and the town lost much of its native characteristics. That said, in 1688, John Eliot ordained Daniel Tekawampe as the first American Indian minister of the Puritan Church in Natick. Things seemed to have been quiet in Natick over the next 60 years until Natick and the neighboring town of Needham became engaged in a legal battle over the possession of a piece of land known as the Needham Neck. The Needham Neck was a finger of land that was claimed by Needham, but reached close to Natick. Many of those who lived there, though technically citizens of Needham, used Natick's meeting house because it was closer than Needham's. Despite this, they still had to pay the ministerial tax to Needham. 
As an aside, this is the first time that I learned that the colony had a form of tithing collected by civil authorities as a tax. Starting in 1744, the Needham Neck changed hands back and forth until it became part of Natick permanently in 1797. Going back a couple of decades, the Boston Massacre occurred on March 5th, 1770. One of those five killed by the British sentries that day was Crispus Attucks, a young man of African and Native ancestry. His Native mother was a citizen of Natick. As the tensions that caused the massacre only worsened over the next few years, by 1775 the British were attempting to confiscate weapons and war material from the colonial militias in the towns surrounding Boston. While their raid on Salem on the 26th of February was a failure thanks to the raising of the town's drawbridge, on the night of the 18th of April they set out once more. Their targets this time were Lexington and Concord. By the following morning, the British troops skirmished with the militia in Lexington and had been routed by them at Concord. While Natick was too far from those battles to send any aid that day, they were aware of the fighting thanks to Abigail Smith, who rode to Natick with the news. Abigail Smith was the niece of the wife of the local Minutemen captain, Thomas Sawin IV. Though as I said, Natick Minutemen were too far away to assist on the day of the battles of Lexington and Concord, 40 of them were present for the Battle of Bunker Hill on the 17th of June, 1775. Like most of Massachusetts, Natick was ready for the revolution, and dedicated to an independent future. They voted to send their tax revenue to the Provisional Congress, rather than to the King, and they passed a resolution of independence two weeks before the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia. Though victory in the War for Independence may have been seen as a long shot at times, that didn't stop the people of Massachusetts from making plans for their future. On the 25th of October, 1780, the Constitution of Massachusetts was ratified. In 1781, Quack Walker had charges filed against Nathaniel Jennison for assault and battery. Jennison claimed that as Walker was his runaway slave and thus his property, it was an assault. Walker countered by pointing to the Massachusetts Constitution and its Declaration of Human Rights, which stated, quote, All men are born free and equal, and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, unquote. William Cushing, Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, agreed with Walker and slavery was effectively ended as a legal institution in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, the full abolition of slavery wasn't cemented in law yet, and this became a problem for Jacob Jonah of Natick in 1787. When he was convicted of theft and subsequently found to be homeless, broke, and in debt, he was forced into slavery to make restitution to the party he had wronged. The next year, the state made the slave trade illegal, but again, slavery wasn't codified as illegal until the adoption of the 13th Amendment in 1865. Once again, we'll jump ahead in the timeline, about 46 years in this case, to 1833. By this time, Natick was becoming a center for shoe manufacturing, and it was in 1833 that Henry Wilson arrived in Natick. Having walked over 100 miles from his home in New Hampshire in search of work, Wilson became a cobbler, or shoemaker, and a prolific one at that. Starting in the 1840s, he had a political career that took him from the Massachusetts State House to the United States Senate and eventually even the vice presidency from 1873 until his death in 1875. He was a staunch abolitionist who was at times known as the Natick Cobbler. I originally had way too much on Henry Wilson. He's a fascinating character and I suggest you investigate him more deeply than I spoke about him here. With that said, the railroad arrived in Natick in 1834, the year after Henry Wilson did. Its link to Boston hastened Natick's swing from agrarian to industrial. In 1837, Natick resident and public school proponent Horace Mann helped to establish the Massachusetts State Board of Education. From 1846 to 1848, the Cachituate Aqueduct was dug from the man-made reservoir Lake Cachituate to Boston. It was replaced in this role by 1908 and ceased to serve as a water source in 1951. The shoe manufacturing industry continued to grow through the mid-19th century, and by 1855, 7,000 men and 500 women were on the job. Just that year, these 7,500 workers produced 1.2 million pairs of shoes. In 1858, the Harwood Baseball Factory opened as the first baseball mass producer in the world. It continued to operate until 1988. In 1860, the shoemakers of Natick went on a strike, a labor stoppage that eventually spread across New England. They eventually won the strike and returned to work with higher wages. From 1861 to 1865, 534 of Natick's 5,000 residents served in the Civil War, of whom 89 gave their lives to the cause. Natick's own first lieutenant, William Nutt, served as an officer in the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, one of the North's segregated units. Many of the North's soldiers wore Natick's shoes. In 1870, the Natick Historical Society, which has provided much of the information I've shared here, was founded. The first speaker of the society was Professor Calvin E. Stowe, husband and author of Harriet Beecher Stowe. In 1872, much of South Natick was destroyed by a fire. 
Two years later, on January 13, 1874, Natick's downtown burned down as well. These events are like many I've seen in cities around this time, as cities grew and firefighting technology really hadn't caught up yet. In 1879, women voted in Massachusetts for the first time, at least in school committee elections. Massachusetts women wouldn't get full voting rights until the adoption of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Now, rolling ahead to the 20th century, we arrive at the Great War. On April 6, 1917, the United States entered the First World War and enacted a draft. Almost half of Natick's military-aged men fought in the conflict. The world would again descend into flames in 1939. The United States would eventually be drawn into the conflict with the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. From December 11, 1941 to August 15, 1945, 2,235 of Natick's 14,000 people served in the Second World War. Of those that fought, 73 died in combat. The population of Natick more than doubled from 1940 to 1960 thanks to the post-war economic boom. In 1952, the United States Army Natick Soldier System Center, or Natick Army Labs, began construction. Natick, like most of the rest of the country, had problems with housing discrimination in the 1950s. In response to this problem, the Natick Fair Housing Practices Committee helped non-white residents find homes in town. One of the founding members of this committee was Mary Crutchfield Thomas, one of the first black women to graduate Tufts University Dental School. Though they would close their doors in 1975, in 1956 the Carling Brewery opened in Natick. In 1975, the Natick Community Organic Farm opened. In the years since, it has served as an educational resource and inspiration for many other organic farms. The next year, the state of Massachusetts officially recognized the Hassanamisco Band of the Nipmuc Tribe and granted them a three-acre reservation. If you never saw it or you don't remember from my video covering Quincy, the state had previously removed all documentation related to the Native American tribes and their lands in 1869 with the Indian Enfranchisement Act that made all Natives American citizens. In 1986, MathWorks, the creators of MATLAB and Simulink, established its headquarters in West Natick. Jumping ahead to the 21st century, we come to 2010, when the Kachichuit and Sudbury aqueducts were turned into public walking trails. In 2012, the praying Indians of Natick held their first public service at Elliott Church in over 300 years. Every year, miles 8 through 12 of the Boston Marathon run through the heart of Natick. Today, Natick is a beautiful town in the greater Boston area. Alright, that's most of what I found on Natick in the real world, but I've got some notes on the topic. First, I want to say that Natick has an excellent historical society. In covering the real world towns that I have in making these videos, I prefer to find the best sources available for the real world history, and in many cases, this has been the product of reading the work of the local historical societies. Every town has their own society, and the quality and availability of their work has been highly variable. While I've come across good work before, Natick has the best online resources available of any of the historical societies that I've visited digitally. Not only do they have the most information, but they also cover both the good and bad aspects of their history. Not shying away from revealing things that we might find morally questionable or downright evil today. Second, and this is a point I've spoken on before, but it needs to be said again, the environmental storytelling is so much better in Fallout 76 than in Fallout 4. There's an obvious reason for this. There were no NPCs to tell the stories at the launch of Fallout 76. And this is not to say that there aren't good points of environmental storytelling in Fallout 4, it's just so much more common in Fallout 76, and glaringly obvious in the places where it's missing in Fallout 4 after having played Fallout 76. A great example of this is the Poseidon Reservoir. There's a single terminal in the Poseidon Reservoir. It has two entries related to the day of the bombs, one stating that the pumping stopped, and the other one stating that the day of the bombs was to be bring your child to work day. The plant is filled with ghouls, but there's no obvious origin to them. Were they the former workers at the plant and their families that joined them there on the day of the bombs? There's no indication to say that this is the case. There could have been notes or holotapes or terminal entries created by the survivors of the bombs as they tried to shelter inside the plant. There's a door to a deeper section of the plant controlled by the terminal. There are ghouls within, but there's nothing special about these ghouls. There could have been a good story here. Even the plant itself doesn't really make any sense. There's two smokestacks on top of the structure, one large and one small. Why? This is a pumping station. Why did it need the large smokestack? Even if the plant had diesel backup generators, it wouldn't need both stacks, especially not the larger one. These stacks could even have provided an opportunity for storytelling. They could have made it so that the pumping station was just a front. Poseidon Energy was heavily wrapped up with the Enclave. There could have been a secret facility here, with the large stack acting as ventilation, or even as a real stack for a secret factory deep beneath the site. 
It feels like this was even hinted at, with the site potentially containing a Poseidon radar transmitter, which seems like an odd bit of tech for a pumping station. Anyway, I'm just disappointed that opportunities like this were missed. Third, I want to know what this boat is doing on Lake Kachichuit. Both in-game and in real life, the lake is a small reservoir with no need for boats like this. I had the same question about the boats on the bed of Lake Summersville in Fallout 76. Along with this, there's a woman's skeleton that can be found on one of the overflow inlets on the Poseidon Reservoir. How she got there and why she has a plastic pumpkin is unknown. There's a small three-grave graveyard in the parking lot of the Western Warehouse. This isn't all that crazy. My company has a small 19th century plot on our grounds. I just thought I'd point it out. Lastly on this point, there's a parking lot on the hill that appears to be a government site, but what purpose it served is also unknown. Fourth, there is an error in Kim Wu's terminal entries, or at least in the placement of the terminal. It's clear that Kim and the rest of the Wu family were supposed to be hiding in the basement to avoid being taken to a detention camp. Despite this, the terminal is found upstairs in the house. I say that it's clear that Kim was supposed to be in the basement because of entries like, the World Series started and Boston is playing, but I can't even go upstairs to watch, and there are people up in the house yesterday who came in while we were sleeping. Kim refers to the television being upstairs, but in the house the television is found on the first floor. Either there are multiple errors in the entries, or the terminal was supposed to be found in a basement beneath Marshall's house. Fifth, I'm fairly certain that Kim Wu's uncle Marshall was not of Chinese heritage. While I have seen him listed as Marshall Wu in places like the Fallout Wiki, I think that the reason the Wu family fled to his house in Natick was that he was able to provide a non-Chinese front behind which they could hide. Marshall had people over to watch the World Series and Kim wasn't allowed to go upstairs because of, quote, bad people in the neighborhood today, unquote. I think Marshall wasn't forced to hide from these bad people because he had no reason to fear persecution. I believe that his wife's song was his connection to the Wu family, and that while he wasn't Chinese, he also didn't harbor the anti-Chinese sentiment that many of his neighbors might have had. Alright, I think that'll do it for the story of Natick. If you want to receive notifications when I launch lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. I've opened my channel's Discord to the public. If you're interested in discussing lore, announcements on upcoming content, or voting on the next lore video, come on by. There's a link in the channel's banner. I stream on YouTube once a week. Starting this week, I'll be streaming Friday evenings. If you're interested, come and check it out. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Dark Malcontent, Real76, Dr. Orion, Samsung Smart Fridge, Knight Spearhead, and Ahotep for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.